is up, you beautiful buggers. Welcome back to another episode, another ranty video. Here we're back here at Fury Craft. I'm Jack. Over there in the corner, that's Ben with the nice lights that he's got. And I've got my very bland uh, studio. Well, studio is actually my bedroom. But obviously, as you can tell by the title, obviously, uh, we've been going through this whole thing with the killing joke. So we're actually in the process of writing a full script for now. But obviously, we're keeping things like quite hush hush because you know there's going to be probably one or two people on here that are probably going to nick some ideas, but you can't have them. All right, so we've done a few videos. I got a few more coming up about the Joker, Batman. I've been diving into a lot more of DC, and it's been a lot of fun finding out a lot more stories about the Joker, like the Batman who laughs, all these kind of different stories about the Joker, which I love. And with the Joker being such a dynamic character. It just only seems fair that instead of the, I know there's going to be a few of you which are going to shoot me down for this, but I know you like the other Joker film with Joaquin Phoenix, but it's not a Joker story, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of an iffy one, that one. Yeah, like, just get this out of the way. That's not the Joker. It's just somebody pretending to be the Joker. Sorry, I, I'm not into it. Sorry. So if we're going to go into the killing joke, which is without a doubt the darkest story, one of the darkest stories, I should say, of the Joker. And it goes on the whole prowess and the whole um, thing of trying to turn a Jim Gordon insane with just one bad day. That it takes one bad day to drive somebody absolutely insane. And so that's what we're going to explore. we got a few casting ideas that we've uh, meddled about back and forth with. You may have seen the video which I did on casting the next Joker, who should be the next Joker. And in just in case you haven't seen that, then this is going to probably be a bit of a surprise for you. So, without, without further ado, let's get ready to... Rant! I'm sorry, that was a very horrible intro. intro. I'll ne I won't do that again, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the thing when you go live, there's no editing. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, folks, Jack's a bit unused to the whole concept of going live and actually having brain cells, because they seem to be drained by the time it comes to Sunday. But there we go, that's just part of being a grown-up. Yeah, exactly. As we go into this whole thing with the killing joke, the story of uh, the Joker explaining to the main characters that it only takes one day to drive somebody mad. You have the whole story of uh, Barbara Gordon. This is not going to be spoilers, but if anybody doesn't want any spoilers for this story, please just go watch the killing joke and come back because, yeah, you just have to watch this. But when it comes to the spoilers, with Barbara Gordon, who obviously you know is Batgirl, gets shot in the back, she gets paralysed, she has the whole story arc of going on to become Oracle. Uh, Jim Gordon gets kidnapped by the Joker, trying to be driven insane. Batman got the whole thing, he's got the whole cycle, the whole story of coming after the Joker every time he goes to Arkham, gets out, brings him back in, and the cycle just continues and repeats itself. But it tells the whole story as well, which I believe to... Um, I think Ben believes to be the main origin story that we can all get behind about the Joker with about the story about the struggling comedian trying to provide for his wife. And you have the story of when he dons the red hood and that's where the Joker story begins. But would you say it's probably the darker uh, story that we have that's actually been fleshed out into a feature film? I would say yes, because it, as I said to you yesterday, because the Joker is such a iconic villain, they never outright said it was his definitive origin because it humanises yeah. him too much. But at the same point, I'd rather it humanise him, him too much because then it proves the point that it does take one toxic bad day to make you become the clown prince of crime to a degree. Yes, of course, yeah. I mean, the other thing I said to you yesterday of course is that technically batman had one bad day as well and that made him him to who he is and i think that's kind of why the both of them are such iconic characters is that they both have such tragic beginnings and they both have like even though they're like on like one side's on this side one side's on like good bad the ugly and but when you have like that like so many interesting parallels with each other like they can't be separated from one another just by how different they are yeah it's it's a very interesting relationship between Batman and Joker because I can't think of many other heroes and villains that have such an iconic 
balance, if that makes sense. Like, there are so many heroes that have so many different villains, it doesn't matter. But the majority of stories that have centered around the idea of Batman and Joker, I lose count because it, they're such an iconic story like combination to the point where you get the Batman who laughs that the only way they could take him down in Dark Knight's Metal was by Batman and Joker teaming up, yeah. which proves the point that they can work together if it were objectively. Yeah, of course. But the thing is with the killing joke is that it is such a dark, it's such a tragic story as well that it's a poor man on his luck basically struggling to get by in a very toxic city before Batman even existed. Well, just before Batman existed. Yeah. But I think we both agree that we'd rather have the Joker older than Batman to make it more that... Because within the whole origin story of Red Hood slash Joker, Batman comes across the Red Hood and it's just in his early days where he kicks him into the vat of acid, which eventually makes him into Joker. Yes, yeah. But I said to you, it would make it more sense that if the Batman actor were to be, say, a lot younger than the Joker, then it would be more reasonable to understand why he was so naive and so irresponsible because he was only just learning as Batman. But in the, well, comic book animation movie adaptation, which is a hell of a phrase to say, um, I don't think there's much of an age difference between Bruce and Jack Napier. Well, it's never it's never truly elaborated on. But then again, as Jack Napier as as Napier as the Joker, it just it doesn't seem like um, it might just be me, just like with like the whole with like what happened to his face and everything. It just seems like it's. It's ne it's impossible to tell exactly how old the age of the character is, but whereas mm. Batman, you can kind of even though it's animated, you can take an educated guess. And with Batman, I'd take a a ballpark figure of that he's um, at least mid thirties, maybe yeah, late late maybe late thirties, right? So yeah, I would yeah, it has to be around late thirties because then you get Barbara Gordon, who's around her early twenties as she's just going off to college which is a thing that we could add in later on in this discussion because things do get a bit hot and heavy in this particular story between him yeah. and Batgirl. I mean, let's get, let's get this part over with, shall we? Because it's probably one of the most awkward parts of the entire thing. Apart is from, that, apart, yeah, if I could just interject quickly, apart from that one panel in a certain comic... I can't remember the name of the comic. Uh, the name of the comic, and if I did remember the name, I probably wouldn't tell you anyway. But there's a certain comic panel that Batman and DC fans in general were raving about because you see a scene with Batman naked, and obviously yeah. you see the you know yeah. what the black the, the bat schlong the the beef thermometer <laughs> bat trudging. Yeah. And like, the only thing is, there's only a few comics, as far as I know, that it actually exists. The panel actually exists where you do see the, the yeah, and what, what you want to call it. Yeah. And for the rest of the issues where that were made, the copy ones that were just like blacked out in editing afterwards. But yeah, like when you were talking about the scene um, with like the whole hot and heavy thing, like, do you want to go into this? And then we'll just skim past and get straight into the casting of Barbara. See. The thing that I kind of find a bit odd with the whole concept of the Batman and Batgirl rooftop thing is it's obviously implied that there's sexual tension, but the fact that she's only just a college student and he's got to have had at least 10 years experience as Batman at this point, minimum. Yeah. You have to try and logistically work back the age gap. And I know there are people that obviously have age gaps to a degree that large and they work as a couple. But my personal feelings towards the idea is that it's just a bit of an iffy one. Yeah, I can see what you mean, yeah. But the only way it could work is like if Batman, say, wasn't like mid-30s, it was like just on the verge of... 30 so it's not such a large gap if that makes sense i suppose so yeah 
But the thing I said to you, to add into perhaps a better tone and drama and plot to it, is have add in the idea of Nightwing as well. Because to those of you who may not know, because they don't research much into the love interest side of comics, there is brief moments where both Barbara and Dick, also known as Nightwing, as well as the first Robin, have an on-again, off-again relationship. Which I find works better because they're roughly around the same right age group to do as they do. But it'd also be an interesting way of bringing in like Dick trying to compete to be better than Batman because that's the whole reason why he became Nightwing, to try and show that he doesn't have to become Batman to be better. He can do it on his own. Yeah, which we do have a few things in the script already, which uh, we've been going through a bunch of scenes, and there is a few things which we don't... Obviously, going to be careful what I say for this, but because we don't want to give too much away. But when it comes to like this, this script, it's just fleshing out the ideas. We don't want to completely rework the killing joke because that's just that's going to be the death nail straight away. You mm-hmm. know, it's not it's not changing the killing joke. It's still going to be exactly the same. A lot of the scenes are still going to be the same. It's just adding certain elements in that we feel maybe um, could like could improve and make a more dynamic story for the killing joke when eventually it comes to around when we actually make this thing. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, The Killing Joke is the most iconic Batman story, in my opinion. Yes, for sure. We're not, like we've just said, we're not fully changing it. We're just adding little tidbits to try and... It's kind of like just doing doing brush-ups in a way. Yeah, it's basically just giving it a bit of a nudge to try and give it a bit more of an edge, a bit more to it than the so, usual story uh, so yeah so it's not like frame to frame exactly the same as the animated feature mm-hmm. but we were so, sort of sp- yeah we were spitballing just as like a personal thing like if we could figure out the right actor for joker who would it be and we both said well, that it would have to be with three kind of characters, didn't we? Well, well, I came up with three. You came up with three, but we both agreed on one that I came up with, which was Jim Carrey. Now, I only mentioned him just because of the zany attitude that he had while playing the Riddler back in Batman and Robin. Yeah, but that wasn't really the Riddler. It was more... all, All you could see is the Joker. But this is it. I mean, at the end of the day... Jim Carrey, I'm surprised he's never been cast as Joker before. Nor have I. Like, he played The Mask, he's played Ace Ventura, he's like, played the guy so can many do, random... The guy can do any role. Yeah, but the fact is that he is so... I don't know what it is about him, it's almost like his body is literally a walking rubber band, because he's so stretchy when he moves, it's like you don't... And like, and yeah. you've seen, have you seen like in interviews when he's like talking about characters like the facial expressions yes. he do and stuff like that? Yes, but that's the point. It's like he's so malleable as an actor that I mean, he does, he does like romantic stuff. Like, yes, man, he can do the Grinch. He's done the mask. The guy's done everything. I mean, just for God's sake, just make him the joke already. He's the perfect guy for it. Every time Ex- I was looking back at the Killing Joke, I was rewatching it and I was thinking. I was going through like acts in my head and like films I've seen and just going, who can play this? Who can play? And the one that screamed out to me the most, obviously Jim Carrey, is just the one that there is no other choice for me except for the other two, which I find could have been good, mm-hmm. but they do have some flaws. So one of them was Adrian Brody, who you might know as Jack from King Kong, and also mm-hmm. from that brilliant film, which is The Pianist. And He's a such a brilliant method actor. I mean, this guy's method acting goes above and beyond. Like for the pianist, just very quickly for anybody who's not seen the pianist, he's basically a Jew, he's basically a Jew in a Jewish prison or a war camp, and he ends up being like the sole person surviving in kind of like this uh, village slash city, and uh, who eventually loses his mind. And basically, this one he's lost um, his family, he's lost everything that he has, and all he has is himself and losing his mind. And so for method acting, and this is method acting, he really broke up with his real life girlfriend, sold his car, sold his phone, sold his, got rid of his flat, sold all of his material possessions to really get that kind of feeling of loss for his Mm -hmm. role. 
I don't understand why you couldn't have just acted, but that's just me. This guy takes method acting to the extreme. So that's why I feel when it comes to the kind of like the violence of the joke and the sadisticness, I feel like he'd be the like one to really um, put forward a lot of effort into his character. But at the same time, it's difficult to see him in that role apart mm. from maybe like the kind of the slaps, maybe the kind of slapstick stuff and the more kind of physical stuff. True. But what was your other choice? Because the other choice was none other than William Defoe in from the Green Goblin, aka Norman Osborn, aka the Green Goblin. So from Spider Man, from Spider Man number one. See, I kind of get why you say that because he does have the right facial structure of the Joker. He does have the sinister grin. He's got the mentality to a degree. But do you feel he kind of steers a bit too much into maybe a Heath Ledger Joker? He sort of steers more into the homicidal side, but not like the just like pure insanity side. Yeah. And the thing is, like I said to you, is like the thing that people forget about the Joker is that he's not technically insane. He's got something called super sanity, which is basically he, he is fully aware that he is a comic book character. That's why all the things he does, he just doesn't care. He just laughs it off because he yeah. sees that none of his actions have consequences. And while I can kind of see De William Defoe like being kind of like that because he was almost like that as Green Goblin in the Sam Raimi yeah, movie, yeah, yeah. it was. I don't know. The voice of the Green Goblin, I could not stand. I don't know why he had to have like, such a weird voice for Green Goblin. Yeah, we, it was just kind of like, um, when he's got that scene in the mirror where he's like, you killed them, he's like, we killed them. Like <laughs> The thing that it kind of reminded me of is um, the Wicked Witch of the West from Wizard of Oz going, I'll get you and your little dog too. <laughs> <laughs> just like, but it, like that's the only drawback to him is that when he does a sinister voice, it almost sounds like Joe Pasquale on a chainsaw massacre. <laughs> well, for Joe those Pasquale, of... if he had auto tune. <laughs> so, for those of you in America who's wondering who the hell is Joe Pasquale, he's a comedian here in the UK. But oh my god, it sounds like he's on helium twenty four seven. His voice is so squeaky that I wonder if he ever went through puberty. If he did. Well, how bloody high and squeaky was he before, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I swear this guy, I swear this guy just inhales helium most of the Probably. day when he's awake. I swear. So if we, yeah, like obviously that was a little bit of a tangent. Sorry, we do this a lot of theory craft. It's what we do. It's the reason why we have a channel in the first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've been doing like our little videos. I got a few more to do on Batman. A few which you need to look out for, ladies and gentlemen. A few about like a Batman makeup mishap. All that kind of stuff's coming, which we'll talk about near to the end. So, if we're going to go back to Barbara Gordon, uh, Ben actually came up with an actress, and it was the first choice. We didn't really need to speak of any other choices, as I definitely feel like this is the perfect one. So, Ben, who would you cast as Barbara Gordon, aka Batgirl? Emma Stone. Only uh, because she is such a smart and intelligent woman already. I think all she would need is like a diverse course in like doing martial arts and she'd be set because she's not the typical female actress that seems to be so ditzy and then suddenly lands a role that's way out of her league like Megan Fox. But she knows what she's doing. When she was Gwen Stacy for The Amazing Spider-Man, she actually had herself a useful part. Like, considering the comics where Gwen, Gwen Stacy was pretty useless like the only thing she was good at was dying like she died twice i think <laughs> yeah she's died twice but the fact that they made gwen stacy a pinnacle character within two movies and still managed to give her a decent Absol death scene a absolute home run in my opinion but that's the point like for emma stone i cannot imagine her doing anything better than being barbara gordon but she would obviously need the training to do the martial arts because I don't think she has much in the way of knowledge of that. Um, I, I wouldn't. I honestly would not know. I'm not sure. But when it comes when it comes to like, especially the actress in herself, 
I've noticed that whenever we've done fan cast, I mean, we've done like fan castings of a few other films. Like most recently, we've done the X Men, and we've done yeah, we've done the X Men for, for the New Mutants. But for this one, I have kind of noticed over time when we've done our fan castings, our fantasy cast, that we try to go for as well for actors who look like the characters as well. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, I just kind of feel like that's important. Otherwise, maybe you have too much of a disconnect. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that's easier said than done. But yeah, I feel like you've got Jim Carrey, who looks like the Joker from The Killing Joke. And you've got her, who I I see Barbara Gordon. I can see her like that. Yeah. But the thing is, is like, I can't remember. Did we come up with who was going to play as Batman and who was going to come up and play as Nightwing? Because that was the two things that I wanted to go over next. Okay, well, just very quickly, we'll get very quickly, we'll get Batman out of the way. You had a suggestion from Mark Wahlberg. Yes, only because he was actually quite a decent actor to a degree in the Transformers saga. Despite the fact that he was a bit of a wet blanket sometimes, he is a pretty decent action movie star and he can have his moments where he is a bit funny like he's not very funny but he's funny enough to be like a because the thing is with batman he's not always dead serious he does have his sarcastic moments which i think that he could do to a degree if it was written right if it was up to me i'd have christian bale back but obviously he's not going to do another he's not i'm pretty sure he's never going to do another batman probably not i mean it depends on what movie he's got going on because the amount of times that he's gained and lost weight for those roles, it shudders belief how he stayed alive. What? Yeah, one. Of, I mean, like I think he got really fat for one film. Then for the Machinist, he went super thin, and then he had three months to put on all that muscle for Batman Begins. Then he went back to thin again. Mm. Yeah, the guy is a yo-yo dieter. I swear. Yeah. But... Oh my god, the guy can friggin' act. If you've never seen American Psycho. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is probably one of the best performances he's ever given. But of course, we were also going to try and figure out who to play for Nightwing. And mm. did I. I think this, this is, is the one. This is interesting. I think we can, I think we can uh, bash ideas about right now because I don't think we came up with the definitive answer no. for Nightwing, I don't think. No, I think that was the one that we struggled with most because obviously. We've not had many interpretations of Nightwing, but we wanted somebody within the same age range of Emma Stone. Oh, we did come up with somebody, actually. And, mm-hmm. it's, a, and it's a controversial one, where you came up with this one. I can't remember if it was you or me, but a um, bit of a controversial one. But I have a feeling, from your way of thinking, it could work. But ladies and gentlemen, please t- timestamp this so you know that we're on the same track in the comments section. But what about... Zac Efron. Yeah. Like, I just, yeah, I, I could see that totally. It's just, I mean, he's got like the kind of the sarcasticness, but also a bit more of like a, I would want to see a lot more of a serious side of Zac Efron than just like the kind of, you know, bo- asshole boy next door, basically. I can't, Pretty well, much. I, I feel we've kind of had enough of those kind of roles, but then again, saying that, we saw him in. Uh, Shockingly violent evil. I'm not sure if I got that in the right order when he's playing Ted Bundy. And my God, that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. But he's also got the right build for it. I think he does to a degree know like how to do proper backflips and proper martial artsy stuff to a degree. Yeah. But I, I can't honestly think of anyone in his sort of age group that would be worth the hassle. I mean, yeah. you could perhaps get one of the Hemsworth brothers, maybe Liam Hemsworth, but then obviously... I, I don't see that person. No. It's... Yeah, it's a bit of an iffy one, because other than the Titan series and Batman and Robin slash Batman Forever, that's all we've ever seen as an older version of Robin. Yeah. But... Obviously, there are other bits and bobs that we wanted to add along the way. Well, so the I, think cre- we've got, I think we've got a Commissioner Gordon, don't we? Yes. In my video, I mentioned the idea of Tom Selleck to be Commissioner Gordon, just because he has... He, he looks kind like of, a cartoon. 
Well, he reminds me of like one style that they use for the Batman The Dark Knight Returns, where they're a lot stockier build, but he's got the old man look, he's got the glasses, he's got the right moustache, he's got the sort of gruff and like exterior of a man that's gone through hell, but doesn't let it get him down. Yeah, he looks like he's just been peeled straight out of the comic book panel. Mm-hmm. But... The other thing as well is like we got other scenes that we wanted to try and add a bit more backstory to stuff. And obviously the most pinnacle part of the whole backstory of the cutting joke is that Jack Napier, a.k.a. the Joker, is a struggling comedian and has to work with these gangsters to try and get money to try and support his wife and his upcoming kid. Yeah. So the one thing that we both said that for the animated movie was that Although it was good that you see Joker fall into the vat of acid, it was the fact that he changed too quickly. Like, it would have been better as a slower process, so it wasn't yeah. so sudden. Yeah, because you said you wanted to keep that scene the same, but have the setting where he comes out of the pipe and everything and somehow gets his way to a different location, and then I'll let you carry on from there. So the idea I had was that he somehow escapes the vat of acid either through the valve or some way that he escapes and he's a bit groggy his vision's blurred you sort of see it through his eyes that it's all a yeah, bit hazy yeah, yeah. it's all a bit green but he's trundling along back to the bar that he met the gangsters they're the ones that he got set up by so he goes to the bar and he's trying to track down the gangsters they come up behind him and it's like obviously you don't see him yet but they try to sort of rag on in saying, like, what the hell happened? What did you do? Like, why did this all go wrong? We put yeah, our like, trust in you. Yeah, and you see, like, you have, yeah, because obviously, like, if they're not blind or whatever, they would have known about, like, the two guys who got killed. And for anybody who is a bit unsure, and the one who dons the red hood in the cave, the red hood is the one who takes the fall, basically. Yes. So, pretty much. Be que they'll be questioning how the heck is this guy alive or not been arrested, you know? Exactly. So they they come up to him and saying, well, because you've done such a crappy job of what we asked of you, we had to do what we did to your missus. So they admit to that they like wiped her out or what, some way of like saying that she was gone. Like we can't say the actual word because obviously this. So, so that's where he has kind of his second break then. It's sort of at that point that you have him sort of slowly chuckle to himself and he goes, well, this reminds me of a joke. Two guys walk into a bar and then, bam, the, you just see the two guys' heads just blown to pieces. And it's like you slowly pan round and you see him just like slowly go more and more white and more and more sadistic to the point yeah, where he's just full on cackling with laughter. And well, that's yeah. where you get the Joker. Yeah, I was sort of like just kind of... Um... I just had this like image in my head, just um, obviously like it's kind of like I like your scene, but like I had these different images in my head of like maybe, maybe somehow acquires a gun, or even just uses something as simple as like a pencil or something to like stab on them in, in the throat or whatever, or just jumps on one of the guys and as he's nailing him with every single punch, that when the camera flips back to the guy, then him, but the guy him, like gradually starts going a bit more like whiter, the like the brown hair starts going more green, and that's mm -hmm. kind of like. It's kind of it's I I'd rather see a slow metamorphosis and a slow build because I want to see the process of how he turns like his face turns yeah. into the Joker instead of just go bam here's the Joker out of the pipe. Yeah. So. But then we also mention in like what other things to add into because there is quite a lot of dark sort of scenes towards the end of the movie in the carnival and. We were saying about that maybe the carnival, because obviously we want to add in Nightwing, it could have elements of his past because the Joker knows everything. You could have like elements of the Flying Graysons because obviously that's Dick's one bad day where his parents died that made so, him into Robin. Yeah. So, you so, could add, so, so you could have the same, you could have the same tent, the same setup as when they last performed. Exactly. I mean. There are some elements to the animated movie and the comic panel that we were both a bit flummoxed by the weird cherub people that were like, I don't like them. We we couldn't figure out like the point and, of that. And like the whole 
BDSM thing. I'm not going to explain what that means. <laughs> no, it's a bit of a... It, it's an iffy one, to a degree. Like, obviously, it's meant to be a dark movie, but it's not meant to be that sort of movie. No, it's just it seemed a bit more silly than anything, than serious. Mm. I mean, but that's like the Joker is meant to be mad and everything. I get that, but I would have much rather preferred maybe, um, maybe instead of the cherubs, maybe having them dress up as maybe old, maybe old villains from Batman's past, stuff like that. So mm. it's kind of like that one bad day thing. It's constantly echoing like what happened in that one bad day. So it's constantly recognizing the past and like what's being brought forward. So it's kind of, there's that kind of foreshadowing and that kind of hidden meanings, which are in our version of the killing joke. Mm -hmm. I mean, we also, we were trying to figure out other things that they could have added into the fairground. Perhaps that you got the idea Bruce goes into a tent. It's lined with to uh, Joker gas and obviously fear toxin, so it warps his mind. And he goes traveling back to his one bad day and he relives the accounts of being a kid and his parents die in front of him. What else did we have? We had so many different ideas yesterday. Well, I've got them all wrote down in my book, but I think I've got a pretty good memory for all of these. But um, yeah, we spoke about we spoke about um, the ending of the film. It's kind of the thing which has to remain pure. It has to be like it is in the mm -hmm. animated feature, just with a few little tiny tweaks here and there, such as one thing with. We want to keep like the ending monologue, the scene when he goes and, like, you know, this reminds me of the joke, and then he tells the joke about the two uh, lunatics with like the flashlight and the rooftops joke. Mm -hmm. So you have that being kept the same, but instead it's kind of like more aesthetic things. So you have that. I'm sure if you've seen the Killing Joke, then you would have seen that scene where like you have the Joker he's on a microphone and he's wandering through all these different panels, and it's just flashes of people who are, like, all, like, kind of warped and just crazy. But instead, we wanted to have a bit more of a darker scene, so maybe, like, old-fashioned TVs. So maybe it was, like, constantly just different images of the Joker from, like, what, what, what Ben said, different images of the Joker, different videos of every time they fought and every time the Joker got away. So it's constantly reminding Batman of those failures. But... With a main failure as well, kind of having Batman in that ending monologue recognize that it was kind of him who's responsible for the reason why the Joker is as the way he is. Mm -hmm. as he was trying to capture the Red Hood, and obviously Red Hood was the that was the only time the Joker was scared of Batman. Fell into the vat of acid, so it's basically Batman feels kind of responsible for what happened to him. So is that something that you kind of want to include in some lines in a little subtle way at the end? I would say, like, the obviously there's the bit where they talk about the joke, and obviously Batman. I would say before Joker says his like two lunatics joke that Batman has a discussion saying like someday it's going to come down to just me and you. Yeah. Either you take down me or I take down you, but I'm trying to give you an olive branch. I'm trying to give you a chance here. Like, there is. So There's medication really that him and stuff. Yeah. And he talks about that. Like, I know, obviously, I'm the reason why you are the way you are. I was there that night that you were in that Red Hood get up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry this happened to you. Yeah. And it's. I would, so I would love to see that. It's kind of like you might see that break in Joker, just even if it's just really brief, but that slight break in the Joker way, kind of, instead of the Joker, you see Napier again, very slightly. To a degree, yeah. I mean... Not too much where it's just, like, it's the hard bit because you don't want to humanise him too much, but you still want that little bit of humanity still there. Yeah. I mean... The thing as well is, like, the whole joker I person as a whole... We were debating whether or not to add in Harley Quinn or even just Dr. Harley and Quinzel earlier on, just to sort of have as like a tidbit for a later movie. Yeah. And I said to you that obviously it's a bit of an iffy one, their relationship. 
But I'd also add into the idea that it wasn't the Joker transformation that made him like that with her. Like he was always like that to an underlying degree. Like he was of like course, that yeah, with yeah, his yeah. previous wife. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. obviously, it's not a scene that people want to fully appreciate to see in a movie, but they do use it a lot in soap operas. So I can't see how it can't be used in like five seconds of a movie to demonstrate. That he's quite an abusive man. You could show that it's basically because of him being on the edge all the time, because of struggling. Like, yeah, because like money problems, the stress, the guilt for not being able to provide for his family. All of those things take a toll on your mind. Exactly. So it shows that the Joker has always had these tendencies to lash out. It's not just because of transformation. If anything, it just accelerated it and amplified it. Yeah. Because... If that was the case, then obviously every person that came into the contact of the Joker serum or the toxin or whatever would all become a Joker, but they don't. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, what else can we add to this today, dude? Well, I think we've like gone quite a lot in already, but there is <laughs> one, one tiny little thing which... It's not a problem that I have at the end of the film, at the very, very end. But it's just kind of like, um, I love the whole thing with the ending scene with like the Joker and Batman laughing is kind of, it leaves it on such a cliffhanger that we don't know what happens. Although there's like been kind of, there's been theories about what happens all over the place. There's loads of them. But before, before we get into that and finish up, the one thing about that scene is obviously when you know, he goes like, "Are you?" When he's talking about the joke, but are you crazy? You'll turn the light off, and then I'll fall to and fall to my death. And then, obviously, you have the Joker that starts laughing first. I would have for the, I would have Batman chuckle first. Batman has to laugh first. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree because I just love that scene when Joker laughed first. It kind of, I don't know. It just. It just didn't sit well with me. It still had the same effect, but I just thought Batman should have laughed first. No, I completely agree, because the thing is, of course, the Joker is always laughing, so, like, it, you can't take the joke on face value of the idea that it's a funny joke. If it was Batman laughing, then obviously you know that it's a joke that actually is worth laughing at. So, yeah, obviously, exactly. it shows that even Batman has his humanised moments. I think that's the main factor with the entire movie, is that it's two men that went through a big trauma in their life, became someone else, but they still have a level of humanity to them to a degree. Exactly. And then you have like the end of that the end of that joke. If you have Batman laugh first, if you think back to the beginning when he's a struggling comedian, after all of this crap that they've gone through together, he makes Batman laugh. Mm -hmm. Isn't there just like a bit of artistic beauty just in that little tiny scene in there? It's like cosmic irony to a degree. But yeah, I think well, all in yeah. all, all in all, obviously we don't want to give away the game too much of what our idea is. We just had these little tidbits that we wanted to make the movie a bit more interesting. Yeah, we've had to be a bit sparse deliberately because we're still working on it. And it's going to be a long process and hopefully eventually may get into doing a crowdfunding eventually and making this thing, I do hope. So by the minute, it's just in the development stages. But there is one other thing which I wanted to discuss with Ben just for a little bit of fun and just for you guys, because I want to hear what do you think happened at the end of The Killing Joke? Because you actually pointed out this out to me. I didn't really notice it at first. It was only so, when we watched it back when obviously you have the scene of like them like laughing together at the end, camera pans down. What were you saying to me? So I said to you that Obviously, the Joker laughs first, then Batman joins in. Yeah. Joker's laugh stops, and Batman's carries on until it fades to black. But there's nothing... Like, surely it would so. be the Joker... Well, obviously, as well, is like Batman has his hands around Joker's shoulders first, but it slowly yeah. creeps around the neck, and then it fades away from there. And, and then, yeah, like, like you said, Joker stops laughing. We're not saying anything has happened, but... No, it's maybe but it's heavily implied... So, but it's, what do you it's, think, in your opinion, do you think he did the inevitable, yes. in your opinion? Oh, God, yes. Like, the you fact really that, think so? Yeah, I mean, the fact that he 
shot Barbara, the fact that he raped her as well. I think that's very, enough. Very heavily implied, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very heavily implied, but we obviously know. But it's just like to do so much to one person. And the fact that Batman wouldn't do anything after that, I cannot... Yeah, in my opinion, he would take the opportunity. Because... I, yeah. Well, because that's why he had the conversation with Joker to try and say that he can try and rehabilitate him. He was trying to give him a chance. But the yeah. fact that he said no, that proved to Batman that there was no winning. Because Batman never gives a second chance. It's either one and done or none at all. Okay, so would you still leave our film on that cliffhanger, though? To a degree, yes, but I would do it in such a sense that the it's camera is... Of... But would you maybe have it as, like, there's no right or wrong answer? I would have it so the camera was perhaps a bit closer quarters... And you have him like reach across with one hand at least, and like literally have it on his shoulder, and then it sort of like slowly gets tighter and tighter, but it fades to black as his hand gets tighter around the neck, and then that's it. It goes to the next scene. Oh fuck! Oh my goodness! Because it this is Batman. Like at the end of the day, he could probably kill the Joker just literally with one pit with one finger. He could probably find a way of just literally just. Yeah, and obviously, like the Joker always finds a way to escape to fight another day with Batman. So it's kind yeah. of you're at the you're at the tail end of this now. We're at the end of this train. This is the last stop. So, what do you guys what do you guys think will happen if you if we're writing this? How would you have ended the Killing Joke? And how do you think the Killing Joke ended? Did Batman do the inevitable, which he said he would never do after he's been pushed to this limit? Do you think he rehabilitated him? Or do you think Joker did something? Either way, please let us know in the comments down below as it might make for an interesting story. And if you have any ideas, I might take them on board and give you a mention in the next video. Okay, dope, folks. Well, that was Jack ranting this week and a bit for me. We were just nerding out over the best Batman story there is to date. And, of course, as Jack said, please drop us down any hints and ideas down below. Next week... It is my topic. I'm umming and ahhing whether we should do... There are so many different things that I want to talk about, so I'm going to have to brainstorm. But obviously as well, we do have our little tidbit videos, our individual ones. I will be recording tomorrow and hopefully uploading by tomorrow my video on either Transformers or some other TV series that I loved as a kid. And obviously Jack will have his own videos. So, yep. and uh, yep, and hopefully the next one, which I'll either be recording either tonight or I'll be recording tomorrow, is the theories. Uh, is the theories and the uh, hopefully maybe my own answer and conclusion of why jo why the Heath Ledger's Joker at least has three different stories on how he got his scars. But you're gonna have to wait till either tonight or tomorrow for that one. So there we go. Thanks for joining us, folks. Hope you're all keeping safe, and we'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye.